Hey, Yanni, say me you. Hi, Dan, how you doing, guys? Hey, Daniel, hey, Liam. Hey, how's it going? Good, good, good. Let's see if people join. Hey, guys. Hey there. Who's on the call? Just Dan. Hey, Alex. How you doing? A good size attendance today. That's good. You're lucky, Daniel. You attracted a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> the rooms will be up soon. <laughs> I realize I know nothing about computers. <laughs> <laughs> what? What are we talking about? <laughs> We're talking about Avengers today. <laughs> I can't talk about Avengers. I haven't seen it yet. Ah, damn it. <laughs> okay, no spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to go this afternoon, but I, I think I'm going to carry on working. The hard decisions we make in life, right? Yeah, I know. I'm going to work through the whole weekend. Uh, anyway, just for information for everybody, I'm, I'm recording this call and I'm uh, going to share this one on the Slack channel for everybody that, could, that they won't be able to attend. But in the future, I might convert this stuff into a podcast. So don't share anything that you might not want. To <laughs> I was going to say, I, my, my whole conversation is just going to be a long beat. And that's to either stop me saying anything about anyone or to stop me swearing, right? <laughs> yes. Now you can swear. I'll, I'll, I'll beep it. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. I'm sure I can use the uh, use language that's sensible. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, guys. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, a little bit of uh, Alex. Uh, echo. Alex. echo. Sorry about that. Yeah, hey, Alex. Hi, everyone. Um, quick question. Uh, mentoring, mentoring Monday. Today is Friday. I know. Out? I know. It's 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 been a long talk about <laughs> how should we convert <laughs> this one into maybe something else. But um, I might move it to Monday. <laughs> but it's been just as a background. It's been an initiative that we started with Tanya from Microsoft around Mondays, and then because there was the demand to actually ask question or be directed by. Um, people and and so I, I thought i might as well put the call and friday journey begins where everybody's like winding down or week is not crazy monday is a little bit crazy so proposal for everybody do we convert this one in mentoring friday or do we keep mentoring <laughs> monday and we move it on monday actually <laughs> you're gonna have to do one on wednesdays as well right <laughs> uh well let's see <laughs> anyway cracking on Daniel, do you want to give, I think we have a good, good size attendance. Do you want to give a little bit background about yourself? Yeah, sure. And then we'll um, rock on. Uh, my name's Dan. Uh, I'm the owner of X Service Limited. Uh, I've been in the technology industry for longer than I can remember. I'd have to get an uh, Excel spreadsheet out to, to work out exactly <laughs> when. But I think it was... Uh, Responding to a malware outbreak uh, for a small business when I was about 13 years old was probably when I started. Yeah, but back then it was a bit different. Uh, floppy drives, boot sector viruses, and uh, not so much damage. Uh, I then went and uh, started my career after leaving school. And I started in a contact center support role. Uh, I then moved into uh, desktop support. I was a modern apprentice uh, for several years. Uh, I went on and did some uh, MCPs and then uh, moved into a design role uh, and then solution architecture uh, for a 25,000 seat company doing their client architecture uh, where I did a lot of firewall config, uh, endpoint patching, security, user experience, configuration management, asset management, all the world that involves anyone that touches a uh, an endpoint uh, on the network. Uh, after that, I uh, did a big transformation and then decided to go and try something new. So 
uh, I then went consulting. Uh, I worked in a channel consulting provider and have worked with a large range of companies like HP, VMware, IBM, Fujitsu, Dell, uh, and pretty much every big name, um, La and VAR uh, in the channel. Uh, following that, I did some uh, more consulting with Extrovert, um, and I then set up an advisory services practice. I did that for a few years, uh, and then as time goes on, you decide to try and take on the world on your own. So uh, <laughs> I set up my own business, and I'm just heading up for year four. So I've got a range of experience. Uh, I've done virtual CIO roles. I've run teams of 25 people. I've deployed projects across the globe. I've done uh, a few things from a defensive and an offensive point of view uh, and gone through all kinds of different IT projects and, and scenarios, hopefully helping people leverage technology uh, to their business and personal benefit in a nice, secure manner. So, yeah. That's you in a nutshell. That, that's me in a nutshell. <laughs> Lots of things to many people. Everyone always asks what I do, and then I sit there going, will they understand what I say? Do I even know what I do? Um, so that's always a fun and interesting conversation. So, uh, How did you get in, into the more offensive, dash defensive role? So what attracted you, uh, I suppose, at the, when, when you were 13 to jump on that and and do that uh, incident response or incident analysis and then further on uh, what made you focus a little bit more on the on the offenses i mean i i know you from twitter and, and we know each other a little bit on on the interaction so i know you and the bot word and and the whole shiban of uh try to hack my box so maybe, <laughs> maybe you can talk <laughs> so you can talk about those initially and what, what attracted you from doing those I guess I'll go back to like the, like the beginning of my childhood. Um, so when I was, I must have been eight years old, something like that, a, a, a few years ago, um, my parents bought a new PC for, for me and my sister and brother. Um, and it was like a 486, 66 megahertz um, box. I mean, I networked them. So I was like, I had a bit of a, 10 base T coax cable and everything was great except they got my cousin to hide doom because doom with them was an 18 and I was, let's say eight and uh, I was not allowed to play doom. So I decided that wasn't acceptable and that there was no way that their configuration would beat me. So I hacked myself into being able to play doom uh, much to my parents horror when they actually realized that uh, I reconfigured the sound card because they was on uh, the inbuilt speaker. Mm -hmm. And if anyone remembers back in those days, uh, the sound quality of that was pretty poor. Uh, turning the sound blaster on, on doom when you're a kid is quite scary. <laughs> I, I kid you not. I literally jumped when I, I think an imp jumped out of a dark shadow and attacked me, you know, scary, stuff. scary stuff. So that was kind of my intro into like sort of tinkering. Uh, as I went through, uh, you know, in school, we clearly tried to get access to things that um, you weren't supposed to. We weren't <laughs> supposed to. I was, I was a prefect. I, I defended the network as well as uh, play with things, right? And so you know where to break better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, I, I moved from a like from a career point of view. I, I went in support. Uh, I went in support on the phone. I did support uh, first and second line. Um, I was designing systems to help people. I went from wanting to be a good game designer and tinkering of stuff and level design when I was a kid, uh, realizing I'm not very good at that, but um, hmm. working out I can deconstruct and design systems quite well. So moving forward, you know, my first experience of a malware outbreak was in a, a shop with three PCs and that was like high tech back in the day. Um, hmm. You know, security has always been part of, of design. It's not something to me, I, you know, when we talk about cybersecurity or infosec, or to me, it's all the same stuff. It's technology enablement. I absolutely agree. It's so right. how I got into the more offensive side is uh, I was designing defensively. 
And I think I realized that there was only a limit to how much I'd be able to defend against with having someone else understand the offensive side. So I was doing stuff for um, some organizations I can't mention, but we would have pen testers come in and they would review our designs and then they review the actual builds and configs and then they'd come back to us with a million different config changes. Um, and I was like, right, okay, so uh, I now need to understand more about why I'm going to say yes or no to these and I need to understand the, the impact. Uh, and I think that's really when I sort of started going, right, okay, I need to understand what, what, what I need to configure, what's important to harden and what's not, because we broke windows at one point to the point that fixing it, uh, the GPO change that was put in uh, literally broke windows. So even replacing the DLLs uh, on a box wouldn't re-enable the CD writing function. So I kind of realized it was important to know exactly who would attack, how they would attack, uh, and how I would defend against it, and how I would defend against it in a sensible manner. Like I said, I used to look after 25,000 clients. Um, so patching those and, and securing that kind of global scale was, uh, was a challenge. So I think that's sort of where my, my interest sparked. And then mm. as I was and doing... How, a, did you move, how did you move into more, into more uh, at scale, if you want? Yeah, so then it must be about five years ago. Uh, I started doing more offensive stuff from a work point of view. So we were working with businesses and internally where security uh, priorities were becoming much stronger. Uh, for a service provider, you have to obviously maintain a level of security. So I started doing a lot of internal audits and reviews and breaking into the companies that I worked for, which was always a nice, pleasant experience when you go and tell your boss that. Uh, you by the way. <laughs> yeah, by the way. I came uh, again, Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> you know that salary uh, raise you said you wouldn't give me? Yeah, just happens you have. Just happens, um, magic. Magic. <laughs> the, the finance magic. system has decided to run me <laughs> Yeah. Um, so really that was kind of the, the was a part of the spark in terms of getting more offensive um, what really really hit my interest was I was at Cyber UK uh, a, in 2017 yeah 2017 a year ago um, and I uh, entered the CTF okay. and if anyone knows me at conferences then you know that you know I like to get social um, Anyway, so I entered the CTF and I managed to do okay. I think I came joint third uh, on a team of one versus mainly teams of many. Um, and I'd been playing Hack the Box uh, previously. So I, I joined Hack the Box, I think, relatively soon after it started. Uh, when did it start, actually? Because I was discussing this with Magda, but I couldn't pinpoint when he actually started. Do you know, do you know what? I, I, I don't remember. I spent too many... Uh, too many Saturday nights uh, staying up all night, <laughs> pwning boxes. Um, but that, that was really, you know, that, that was uh, the CTF stuff really, really uh, like piqued my interest. Um, mainly because you can then attack lots of scenarios that you won't necessarily see in real life mm -hmm. or that they'll be similar to. Um, it's something that I work with. I'm on the Many Hats Club CTF team and I'm one of the, uh, the, the grayer haired people on the team. And um, I think I'm the only one with grey hair. Um, yeah, they're, they're quite young. So, so <laughs> just, just, just for information for everybody, um, if you want to give a little bit of background of uh, Hack the Box, because not everybody might know. Yeah, sure. So Hack the Box is a uh, capture the flag uh, platform. And it contains a bunch of challenges, like offline challenges and virtual labs and what we call boxes, which is a, essentially a VM, where the objective is to uh, break into the systems and capture the flags. And that's done via two stages in Hack the Box. You've got user mode flags, uh, where you gain an initial foothold. So you may attack a web service. The web service may not be running a system or admin. Uh, you might be running as a user. You then get the user flag, and then you have to do privilege escalation and own the root stroke uh, system element of a box to get the, the, the root flags. Different boxes flag, have and different... And the flag, correct me if I'm wrong, are just objectives. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, they're, they're literally text files uh, in this yeah. example. Um, and different flags have different points. 
uh, user flags have less points than root flags and different boxes are different strengths. Uh, then you combine that into the fact there's a, a team system and then you've got teams competing around the world to, to try and beat each other, get faster flags, get more points uh, and learn more. So it's quite fun. Um, and it's for free, right? If I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah, there's a, there's a free one. You have to hack yourself in. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> um, it's not very hard to get in to hack the box. You can no, do it with, I, a web, with a web browser. <laughs> try to break the try to break the invite invite me and try to see what part of the page code. Just as a hint. <laughs> you can't give it away to everyone, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but no, then, but it's, it's actually a very intelligent thing. It's like if you really want to do it, just be serious about it. And considering it's free, everybody will actually put some value only if they actually need to put some effort in it. Yeah, sure. I mean, and that's, I mean, I, I pay for a VIP subscription on Hack the Box because uh, if anyone knows the free experience versus the VIP experience, if, if you're on it enough, you will not want to sit in the free world. Though the free world is good if you want to see. Starting what, point. Yeah, it's great for starting point, but it's also good because you can steal each other's shells and oh, tools. Okay. So you can go and see different ways of doing things um, because you've got a lot of people acting uh, offensively on a box. So there oh, are some, there's some fun you can have in, in free, um, which is quite cool. The, so yeah, hack the box has been re really important, I guess. It's, it's great from a training point of view as well. One of the things that um, I think some people don't realize is that from an offensive security point of view, the landscape that you have to deal with is really, really wide. It's everything. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's everything. Process, to whatever you can leverage, right? Yeah, and you're going to be hitting a range of technology that's so varied. Um, it's like if you're in the, in the banking space, who knows COBOL? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, oh, hello, even, Fortran. <laughs> if you think about like when you look at the makeup of most companies um, from a back end point of view, they're usually a Windows network, Active Directory, they've got Windows endpoints, um, and they've got like standard services at the back end. When you get into the web world, you've got like a, a whole range more. So it's, it's pretty much every combination of config and software you could think of in the world, and some you can't think of. Uh, so I think the, the labs are really good. Uh, I actually started building uh, an educational You're platform. Yeah. yeah, so I, I built my Pwn Defend challenges, which I'm uh, still releasing. And the idea behind that is it's very similar to the idea of Hack the Box, except I'm not doing VMs uh, at the minute, so you can't get shells. It's just about web and data theft. I'm oh, also trying to combine other areas uh, which some boxes include in Hack the Box, but I'm trying to make people use OSINT skills. Uh, so for those who don't know, that's open source intelligence gathering. Yeah, that's, that's actually the second question I want to ask if you have participated to any capture the flag like uh, DC or uh, DEF CON or any other, any other capture the flag. So, on, on a... so the stuff I've done, uh, I, I've only played in Cyber UK's uh, CTFs. Uh, okay. One of the things, and this this is why some of the guys on my team, um, we have quite a laugh because they're like, Dan, you've got to go to work and I've got to go to school and actually I'm on holiday. <laughs> so I'm going to sit there and pwn all day and Dan's going to sit there and write a report. Um, getting time to do all this stuff is difficult. There's loads of different... Um, there's loads of different challenges you can do. There's the Hacker 101 CTFs. There's uh, Hack the Box. There's, uh, I think it's Pentest Academy. There's, there's a lot of platforms these days. I, I kind of wish I could go back in time because yeah, this stuff didn't exist very long ago. So the tools and uh, no, you have to be offensive, like really offensive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it's funny. I sometimes describe myself as an offensive architect. Um, <laughs> Because, not using swear words yeah yeah well i swear as well right so the um <laughs> but when you put technology in a business and we've got a huge problem i think uh, from a global point of view the rate of technology adoption is massive and we have literally littered the world and our businesses with, with half complex half-baked misunderstood or not understood uh, technology and the technology is sexy and the CTO will want to jump on the latest tech 
well, as soon as it's available. You need business advantage, right? You need to be able to be fast. You need to be able to respond to your customer needs. Yeah. We do that through technology. The problem comes is that, I mean, it's a bit like uh, back, in the, back in the day, right? What's the things that people strip out when they've got a finite budget, because everyone has a finite budget, and a finite resource pool, and a finite okay. level of skills? There's stuff that you, you know, that sometimes gets trimmed. <clears throat> and that tended to be documentation, project management, and security. Yeah, which in a short well, time. Well, I haven't seen I haven't seen it nowadays. But just before we jump on on the on the corporate run, uh, there was actually a very interesting question on the chat about the skills and how you develop the skills. Because I train myself by just breaking stuff or reading stuff over the web, and uh, but there is a whole series of uh, training. Uh, on on offensive skill like OSCP, um, uh, ethical hacker, or you know any any. Yeah, yeah. So I've I've done the PWK labs, um, and th th there's definitely the route to go. So I mean, from my point of view, hands-on experience using CTF labs like uh, the Hack the Box, using stuff like Vulnhub. Hub. Um, doing courses like the PWK, that's uh, penetration testing with Carly, and that's the OSCP um, mm -hmm. labs. I think the OSCP is probably the more serious one and the more comprehensive one. Consider I haven't done the, the other one, at the um, Certified Ethical Hacker, but I think it's, it's closely related to, it's a bit more dumbed down version. Uh, OSCP tends to be a bit more serious, I found. Um, the, the OSCP is a journey, I think, that you have to go on. Um, yeah. And I haven't... I, it's I mean, a journey you go on of exploration. Um, well, I've done my PWK and I've, I need to just book my exams um, for that. The It, it takes time. Uh, yeah. The labs were but, cool. I quite liked them. They, they weren't... It's, you have to remember, like, depending on where you're starting from and what experience and exposure you've got, uh, different things mean different things to different people. My personal way of learning is to do white box and build the labs and build the vulnerabilities and then attack them and exploit them and then defend them. Yeah, but you're kind of but marking you, your own homework. It's much more fun if you have a vulnerable <laughs> box and it's like you can you can buy or you can get pre-built image of all the OS with some sort of stuff in there and then you can try. But it's like marking your own homework or actually cheating a little bit. It's a, you don't have the passion and the pain of actually stop discovering what system is in there, what version is in there. It's like a, it's almost like a, a white box testing. Yeah, yeah, but the don't don't knock white box testing. Um, Sorry. Don't knock white box testing. No, it's, it's a starting. I think it's a starting to actually discover the techniques uh, and it could be like a step by step. Yeah, I mean, like I said, different people learn different ways. Um, we agree. have to remember that our offensive security practices are defensive security practices for offensive actions. The ultimate goal of all offensive security is defensive security. So mm. how people... <laughs> the commercial version of it <laughs> yeah say. okay yeah we're not talking nation states right because the <laughs> you, you've got to think about the landscape we're talking about the the general scenario yes there are some people who will be authorized to use offensive cyber security capability for destructive reasons right yeah. um but that's a very minority audience uh depending on what part of the world you're in anyway um <laughs> You know, the mainstream offensive security is defensive security, and that's the way I view it. There's no point in breaking into something if you're not improving uh, rapidly the defensive controls around that system. Yeah. Oh, I mean, thank I, you guys I, for, I see... sharing, for sharing the, the information, the OSCP and other information. Uh, we've got so another one as well. Jan is... Yannis says, you have any piece of advice if you have to deal with engineering teams that are not keen on doing infosec training? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, <laughs> so the way I view, uh, you know, security, especially security teams and the way we are integrating technology in businesses, um, is it's a communication game. Yes, there's an absolute wealth of technical uh, 
technical stuff to play with. There's a whole uh, raft of different skill sets, and that includes non-technical uh, capabilities. But when you need to work with people and they need you to make like some changes in behaviors, that's really a comms piece. Yeah. And well, I think you can't do everything yourself, right? It'd be great if you could sit there and go around and, the and do all the code and, and go and harden everything and say no to everyone until <laughs> that, until <laughs> everything was secure. That, that doesn't work. I mean, that's what I call security nineties. Um, it doesn't work. What, what we need to do is security person that is integrated in everything. Yeah, He's yeah. Omnipresent. <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, we all have we have constraints we have to deal with. So, yeah. I guess, and what this is the te some techniques that I use. So, I run workshops uh, with teams uh, to talk through and give demonstrations. I try and show people how to pwn, uh, at least where it's relevant to them. So. If they've developed a logon form as a developer, then we would demonstrate how we brute forced it. We would then demonstrate how we fished someone and how we compromised the controls and then demonstrate why they should use MFA and, and uh, out the box uh, I think techniques. That's, that's, a very, that's a very powerful method to actually show this is actually why it's vulnerable and, and, and showing real life example. What I also use on, on the education side, I think it's, how to's and best practice and principle is stuff that you can embed because sometimes you just don't go through a checklist of stuff. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it, it is useful to have like a reference reference base of stuff you could use or to fix your own thing. So I've, I've found a lot of engineering team that don't, don't come up with fixes by themselves. It's like, how do you fix? How do we fix a problem? I go and I go out and buy a solution, and and I see in a lot of organizations, well, just coming up with their own engineering things, it could be a very much better solution. Yeah, I mean, this is this is something I, I'm quite passionate about. Is we talk a lot, uh, there's a lot of talk around shifting left, but and the focus seems to be shifting left and work with developers, and I'm absolutely not saying that's not a good approach. We do absolutely need to work with people. But what I'm, the way I'm looking at shifting left is actually more into a, a business strategy, into a program, into a financial and business management aspect. So that security gets embedded as part of the cultural DNA and is yeah. part of the uh, strategic alignment process so that you haven't got this issue whereby uh, the old scenario you used to be- struck. You fast track and you don't dedicate enough time. You don't spend time on threat modeling. It's like it takes time just because it shift less. It doesn't doesn't mean that you get free resource on security just because there is a new <laughs> Yeah, so absolutely. That, that's a trick. That's a buzzword. It's like shift left. Oh, we don't need security anymore. Engineer actually can do security. <laughs> you still need an architect. You still need people that think strategically through. Um, and can actually do threat modern and can actually do that stuff with the support of the engineering. I think it's a, it's a joint effort and it's, yeah, it's, I, I, it's a message that I hammer a lot. But. Abs absolutely. I mean, security is a group and team effort. It is not, a, it's not for heroes, right? Um, you, you get not anymore. <laughs> the, that's the way I try and tend to approach it. And you have to, you know, like I say, you keep using the word constraints. Um, you need to work with what you've got to achieve your business business objectives within a uh, legal or regulatory uh, bound framework with the constraints you've got. Yeah. That's, you know, it's complex. These things involve humans. Humans are complex, uh, even more so than the, the robots. So getting good communication. That's why you like robots more. <laughs> I, li I like humans and robots. It's just the, 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 the robots are fun to deal with when you're sitting at a, at a keyboard. The humans are less so fun. Uh, but, you know, there's nothing beats, uh, I say face-to-face, -face, you know, person-to-person -person and person-to-team comms. Yeah, it's more powerful. Doing Actually, demonstrations and stuff and, and showing people and being able to relate to people's... Uh, tasks and their challenges really helps uh, mm. because a developer's job is to, to release features right yeah a pace so we need to help people by explaining that we know that actually that code chain doesn't take 10 seconds and that you know being realistic about how we can 
a uh, improve their skills and capabilities so this that they're coding better testing better um building things into the life cycle so that we aren't moving into prod stroke near prod um in a really insecure config uh, and with a high attack surface yeah but on that i have so I've seen two approaches on that, on that element. I've seen the governance approach where you actually have just an up, a bunch of uh, static scanners that just scan through the code and just throw a bunch of potentially false positives and you spend hours and hours and hours on actually fine tuning your static scanner. Um, and then if you say, I want to deploy at scale, I just put a blocker whenever a static scanner throw me a number of uh, medium and critical and high and I don't promote your code. And I've seen massive transformation fail because of that, because it just, everything was stopped. Yeah. So how do you play that at scale? <laughs> and, and I think the scale, that scale question is, is still a question. Yeah. I think there's different ways and different teams and different organizations. Um, I, I don't, let, let me be controversial. I don't believe you can deploy security at scale. You can do an effort to actually to a fast pace, but not, not at scale. Security needs time to actually look at stuff because it's not trivial stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, no, I, it's I agree. Like it's, it's marking your homework at scale and at speed. You can do an optimization, but you still need time to look at the overall picture and you still take time to digest everything. It's not like a line of code change. A line of code change might be fine, but if I might punch a hole or might introduce a new build, a new vulnerability and that's you only do and you only notice if you look at the whole at the whole code or if you do a retro with your oh. it, it's with like your looking at, it's like looking at business logic as well right so you could have the most secure code base in the world but there might be a business logic vulnerability which means yeah, that all, all that. your products get sold for free or uh, your margins are eroded it's it's complex. We're talking about uh, IT architectures and well, not even that business architecture life cycles, which involve many, many complex components. Um, so, can we say security at scale and security at pace is a, is a failing concept? Failing concept. I wouldn't necessarily use those words. Um, I, like I would say, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would say that the the idea that security is static, uh, or you know, that we can get to a level of, uh, you know, it, it's a constant game of ensuring that you're providing assurance and uh, constantly keeping up with the times. You know, that that's the reality. You don't get to secure. You just get, you get to more mature and well managed and more optimal. You don't get to a you know a secure state. It doesn't exist. Something will pwn you somehow. Yeah, it's um, just fix fast, fail fast, and fix fast. Yeah, I mean, it's levels of failure that you need to tolerate. All of this stuff, in my mind, comes down to risk appetite, uh, especially in the commercial world, uh, and that's where I tend to focus my time. You, you need to have a risk appetite. Your business needs to understand what its risks and what the impacts are, and then you need to build security uh, controls and programs aligned around your business risk appetite. Uh, how, I mean, it's, it's a thing that most businesses I go to don't have. They don't have a statement of what their risk appetite is. And you might have someone running around throwing policies down people's throats. And if we don't understand the, you know, the business appetite, it's very hard to then convince someone to do something differently. So like I said, communication is, is, is definitely the number one uh, the one area that people, I think, should focus on more. Uh, Actually, on the subject of communication, Yanis asked, uh, with the current situation in the market and the demand of good security people, how can you ensure that your people can focus and stay and remain in your team? <laughs> yeah, I mean... How do you prevent everybody going contracting and saying, yeah, thank you, you're giving me a bunch of security training and security skill set, and now I'm going away because it costs much more. Or I can make much more money. I think this is just this is a challenge just when you run a team. Um, generally, it doesn't matter whether it's in tech or tech or if, if you're in, you know, from any business. I guess on security, I guess on security is, 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 is more true so because of the demand and because of the salary rate going higher and higher. 
again, I mean, this goes back to the to management, though. So, in terms of um, when you have a team of people, it's again, it's comms. It's important to work with your team. It's important to understand the uh, the capabilities your business require from your team and the investments and developments that you need to make. Um, attracting and retaining staff requires speaking to them. It requires understanding what they need. It requires supporting them. It requires you know training um, and development. Now, as to what that that is, like I said, different people learn in different ways. Um, I've, honestly, I've seen I've seen both aspects of it, and and I fundamentally agree with you. It, it's a cultural dash, making people feel warm and fuzzy in your environment, so that they stay because they want to stay, not because they're coerced to stay. And I've seen people coerced to say, saying, "I'll pay your master in cybersecurity, but then you stay here for X number of years, unless you want to give back the money." And I've seen them, and I've seen them degrading over time because they're not engaged they're not really interested in the business anymore and so I, I, only I, retain yes go no no go ahead I, I was saying like when you look at the the surveys and the data that about why people leave jobs um it's not always money right if you've got a job that and don't get me wrong because we all need to eat yeah but when you've got a job that's paying a reasonable and appropriate amount of uh, money it's it's making sure you've got a job that's interesting that's challenging that's exciting that you've got a working environment where you're free to uh to have innovation to to do what yeah absolutely there's all these things i don't think i've ever left a job because i was like oh i just want more money in fact, that's usually the last thing I think about when I've looked at uh, changing, um, changing role, changing team, moving to a new, uh, a new organisation. It's usually everything else that causes uh, people to leave. The money yeah, bit's usually a bonus, um, but that's my experience. And I, I, when, I, when I build teams, I try and make sure that we're realistic. You know, I, I will sit there and do a training plan with a team and do a obviously a business aligned um, roadmap Mm -hmm. but we'll also talk about their personal aspirations and what they want to do and look at that over a long period and if their five-year plan is to become ciso yet they're doing uh, an analyst role if that organization they're in can't support that you'd still that's fine you you still build to support the team Mm -hmm. members uh career plan you just align it to your business and you recognize that they'll probably be in the role for three years and then they'll move on. You make the yeah. three years good so that they're delivering good value back. Everyone's winning. Uh, it's when people don't invest in their staff, you end up with negative business impact, negative personal impact, and they're going to leave anyway. Hmm. Yeah. So, good point. Again, all about the humans. Yeah, it's ultimately we are a society made of humans and interaction and communication is the key. On on, on top of that, I, I tend to force, kind of quote unquote, force my team members and I try to influence as many people as possible to give back to the community because you get you get open source stuff, so you, you give back in, in terms of... Uh, articles in in, in terms of uh, talking at conference and contribution. Do you do that as well? Or how do you see yeah, forcing I, people to do that? So f- <laughs> forcing people. I encourage people to um, to explore what they enjoy and what they do with their team members and where appropriate outside. I'm a massive, massive fan of caring and sharing. Uh, I, I put as much content out as I can. Um, yeah, you know, you have brain dumped. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, love I, everything. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I blog on a regular basis. I encourage other people to start their own blogs, to put stuff in wikis, to put GitHubs together. There's, there's two reasons for this, one of which is the sharing point. And, you know, I work with lots of people. Uh, I don't mean to see work, but, you know, I've got a community of people and friends. And we help each other. Um, if people ask me questions online, I help them back uh, if, if I can, or I point them in, in a direction. I mean, I, some roles I think require it. I think the businesses should take more of an active approach, and part of the job role should be to do X and to should support that um, sharing and development aspect from a formalized point of view. 
Uh, and other times, I think you need to work with the person's appetite and strengths. Mm-hmm. Um, not everyone likes sharing everything. Not everyone likes just clicking the post button on the blog because it's nerve wracking because you're exposing your inner views and thoughts to the world. Um, and we all know how the internet and Twitter can be. <laughs> so I think I think Famous security drama. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> the drama clock. <laughs> you say one thing, and, and and if you get it wrong, you know the world can start tearing you a new one. I um, know. I had my fair share on that, but I actually just posting a couple of ideas is like. <laughs> I mean, people have opinions, right? Um, I think you need to, you know, we have to accept that. And not everyone will always, you know, not everyone's going to write blogs. Not everyone's going to write content. I think you just need to get the right balance. Um, yeah. If it's a requirement of the job. So I do a lot of work in sales, pre-sales and uh, business development. We need to get messages out to people. That's part of what we do. Uh, if we've got people who are not doing that and it's part of their function, that's a problem. Um, so communication, back on the communication. Yeah, yeah, so back, back, to, back to the humans, right? <laughs> yeah. I think that's that's really important because uh, you can deal with machines, but the human part is actually the most complex. Actually, Yanis was asking something else. So that is actually an interesting, very interesting question on the pen testing capability or the automated, if you want, testing capabilities in cloud for AWS, as you all, I think, Shall we mention also Google Cloud? <laughs> <laughs> I have actually you know they have massive <laughs> analytics. They have they have incredible analytics capability. They're not very strong in the compute part of that that aspect. But yeah, I mean, so the, I mean, the question is how AWS and pen testing methodology for apps hosted in clouds. Yeah. So, and if you come but, across any solution that are made. So um, there's various different bits and pieces that I've personally done. Uh, on different cloud platforms like Heroku or on AWS uh, or on Azure. And again, this goes back... across Heroku. Uh, yeah, I did, uh, did something not long ago on that. Um, okay. The okay, This goes back to my point earlier about the, the blend between doing white box, uh, gray box and black box testing. There is the cloud is such a wide landscape. Just saying, like, how do you test cloud? It's quite difficult. You might be testing an API hosted on a PaaS solution or a SaaS solution. Um, you're going to have different points of exposure. So, if someone has uh, an, an infrastructure as a service platform and they only expose a VPN endpoint to the internet, you can do a pen test, and you're pen testing the VPN endpoint. What you're not doing is looking at the uh, cloud management planes. You're not looking at the operational processes. So I think it's key key to understand that cloud is such a wide domain and such a range of platforms and capabilities that um, you need to tailor your tests to suit your uh, threat. Risk landscape. appetite. Yeah, and risk appetite. <laughs> but but I mean, it's if I can grab it back, yeah. is, is, is understanding your division of responsibility, what you, should, you can and should do, what you should consider, and uh, the scope of the pen test. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and like I said, scopes of pen tests and how pen tests go to market um, is, a, is a really interesting subject. I won't go on forever about it, but I think as an industry uh, in the security testing space, we need to um, we need to get better at selling more effective security testing capabilities. Um, in my experience, there's a lot more black box testing, and I think it would be better off when we move, hopefully, move white people into a world testing. where we should be white, doing far more white box testing, doing I far do, more do. configuration audits, because you're missing a huge attack surface because people yeah. are sort of picking and choosing the the view and viewpoint from a test, and then they're ticking a regulatory compliance box because they're saying, yes, we've had a pen test. But it might be that you're only testing 1% of the attack One service. Piece. And I notice by doing whiteboard testing, you actually save a lot of time and hence money, and you can refocus the scope on actually saying, let's let's spend time in actually things that are important not on the discovery phase because yeah you think like a hacker you think like 
how much does it take to actually discover all the things but then if you think about from a business perspective you're actually burning out money to not test things in a proper way yeah and so that, you, and you, sorry go ahead yeah no that's uh, in the end we have to remember that the uh, if you think about this from an internet facing perspective uh, and again it depends on your vertical depends on your business or your government function uh, as to what your threats are likely to be but the internet exposed services or your corporate services even on your internal network are exposed to time and time costs money and we don't have huge huge investment to do you know two months worth of hacking to try and take down the site that you might not breach i mean that's one of the realities i think that um playing ctfs can kind of get you in sort of the, the uh, mindset the wrong mindset that everything is pwnable Yes, okay, there are generally ways, but when you start throwing into uh, in, into the real, real world, you've got scopes, you've got uh, exclusions, you've got yeah. constraints. Constraint, yeah. The you know, pen testing world is, is a completely different beast than capturing the play. It's yeah. like, this is your scope, work with this, work with credential, work with this. It's like, if you used to capture the flag, it's like you had to discover everything. It can, it, it can throw you off. You're also expecting to be able to shell everything and to be able to escalate everything. Whereas the yeah, reality, you can say lateral movement and you actually can't laterally move. Yeah, I mean, I've just, I'm just in the middle of writing a blog at the minute, uh, which I'm going to publish in the near future, which is how not to red team. Um, <laughs> and what I've done is I've tried to mix the business angle and the technical aspects to show what you need to have in place before you start paying people to dedicate quite you know potentially substantial amounts of money to hacking your network if you've got a land manager a link local land manager responder um enabled uh they're going to respond to you you're going to get pwned hmm. so it's about making sure we're using the right capabilities at the right time with the right people and the right skills Security um, testing doesn't equal pen testing. Security <laughs> testing means being able to demonstrate that your system can stand uh, just just a, a random kicking and not having a pen test. Pen testing is the actually added intelligence. And that's what I tell people security testing is not pen testing. And that actually is linked to the shift left. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and don't get me wrong, there's a time and place for all different types of activities. Um, but I do think that we as a, as a whole, like businesses and organizations would do better by trying to not stick with old paradigms for security testing, leaving it to the end, doing a pen test from a specific, uh, uh, viewpoint will not really give you the assurance you need to protect your customers and your brand. Ultimately, well, actually, if it worked, then we wouldn't be seeing breaches from, you know, every company, <laughs> big or I small. Think, I think, though, we we'd say we keep on hammering on actually doing security testing, but as an industry, we haven't defined what actually security testing is because I found a lot of people, okay, let's do security testing. What do we test from a security perspective? And then you kind of say, uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we, haven't we haven't defined a methodology to actually define how to break on things. It's like how to do that extra mile to test from a security perspective to, to revert back if you want the use stories into security testing use stories and, and trying to have that hacking mentality before you actually employ a pen test that will actually give you that. I think, do you know what I've done in the past and some of the stuff that NCSC doing I really like is using the uh, cloud security principles mm -hmm. from the initial outset and doing it's essentially a marketing piece but Ensuring you've got internal governance and externally being able to represent to your customers, uh, your suppliers, um, how you are going about providing a security assurance and what activities and capabilities you've put into the, uh, into the services you're offering. But isn't that similar to what the Cloud Security Alliance ultimately is doing with the CCM, the Cloud Control Matrix? Yeah, yeah, but I think this is the right way to go, if that makes sense. So it's it's not just the pen test at the end. It's it's making sure that we embed this stuff in into the DNA. In the of, capability, um, yeah. How you do it. I mean, I don't think of any of these things. Um, I get this with Vital a lot. 
uh, people are like, oh, how do I implement it? And I'm like, well, it depends on what you're doing. I don't think you're going to get a tick box exercise that gets you everywhere for every scenario. Uh, yeah. I think, I think when we start building these things and starting to do this from a strategic and design point of view in a better manner, uh, based around principles, that I, I think we're going to get up, end up with more secure products that are more user friendly, uh, that have controls that work, that are not um, avoided at every opportunity. Um, I think that's but the also, way to do it. Human centric security is kind of what I'm getting at. Yeah, no, and, and I fundamentally agree, but I, I found that we as a design design community, we are stretched because you tend to get involved in every single minutia of the design. So <laughs> doing design smart, I'm, I'm, I'm very keen on doing the design smart. So actually the, I have a rule of 70, 20, 10, 70% 70 of the time spend on project, 20% reverse engineer whatever you have applied on the project and abstract it and make it into a pattern. So you actually have more time of that 70% to actually work on pattern and 10% do research. And all my team does that. It's so like 70% of the time, just focus on the project and then to make your project happy, you earn your money and then other stuff, you actually free your time and you, are, you end up, you end up in a situation where you had 20% of the time on projects and, and the rest is actually research and patterns. Yeah. I mean, time allocation is a funny thing, right? Um, I think this is, again, I think if you look at more modern or new ways of, um, of how we approach, uh, you know, getting work done, as it were. Uh, I think people are starting to realise that they need to, uh, again, make it more human centric, like, and allocate reasonable uh, expectations of time for different tasks. It, it's like I said, some organisations, you know, I've I've personally had been given targets for me or my team. Um, that are like you need to be ninety five percent utilized billable, billable. Right? and I'm like, yeah. it doesn't happen. It doesn't work. No, it doesn't work. And when you I've start, seen, looking, I've seen hundred ten percent billable. I mean, I've I've had people. Hell, I've done it as well. We've, I've had projects and programs where we've had people build a hundred plus percent. Um, but from a sales life cycle, human safety point of view, you need to build business models that give people and cust you know, give everyone a, a reasonable level of service. And Otherwise again, this goes, really mistake. Otherwise yeah, you, well, you, you get people burnt out, you get people making mistakes, you get, you know, you get you all negative outcomes. You don't think strategically. So I've seen a lot of people doing a lot of legwork when they can just take a step back and they're solving the same problem four times in four different ways. If they step back and look at the problem and say, I might solve four different problems with one solution, with one pattern. Like, for example, secret management. I've seen projects implementing secret management in 400 different ways. <laughs> it's like, why don't you set, come up with three options and then apply it and then people can just pick and choose the option and then you, they can come to you if they have a doubt or if they have, like, how do I implement this or how can I implement another pattern? Uh, well, this goes back to you know people not having standards and architecture practices and architecture is a different is a difficult beast to come up with because sometimes it's difficult to justify the role of an architect especially in the DevSecOps world when they say oh let's let's throw everything at the engineering what does the architect add as a value and I would say it's the holistic view and it's the consistency and it's the strategic view that they can work with engineers says you have four different problems you can solve it with one solution if you focus on just one specific problem you miss that solution that holistic solution yeah sure i, I completely agree it's, it's also about prioritization and where what battles do you fight yeah you know actually before before we close we, before we close off because the, which we're running out of time. I have just one specific question on the pen test and I was really curious to ask you. If you're doing a pen test specific on a SaaS solution, if you stumble across other people, credentials, or you, you kind of breach the scope because you, you break the system well, in a you, way that- If you accidentally break, uh, breach scope. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I, and I, and I stepped in, in a couple of pen tests that way and I had to alert the SaaS provider saying, by the way, we just found out all your customer information. What do you do? Oh, I personally have not broken a SaaS platform um, with a 
like a major, sorry, you know, a, a massive multi-tenant SaaS platform's capability. Um, no, even smaller one. But what would you do? What would you do in that case? Well, I mean, I would, I would open a dialogue with the uh, the provider. Um, you know. Yeah. In the end, it's logged what you've done, right? So you, you've got a vulnerability. If you're working on behalf of a tenant and you've managed to affect the service provider's platform, then you should report that to the service provider because you won't be able to fix the... It's highly likely you can't fix the vulnerability through the tenant side uh, interfaces anyway. Yeah. So if you you, you need to report that to the your client... Um, you know, if, but it's if it, tricky they, from a legal dash commercial. Yeah, yeah, that, that's that's <laughs> that's why I'm being a bit ambiguous. Um, yeah, I know. It's a bit like what what happens when you see things when you know you're not meant to see them. Yeah, we, anyone who's uh, spent enough time in proxy logs uh, or uh, trawling disks uh, and network systems, you know, you, you find stuff. It's sometimes a paperwork nightmare. Yeah, you know. Um, <laughs> but that's the commercial hey, aspect of it you need to work within your own risk appetite and in accordance with any laws and <laughs> it's, it's, it's difficult because it's recorded right <laughs> yeah 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 absolutely the um no but it's great isn't it? some stuff is great let's not lie about it uh, i mean a lot of the OSINT work we do uh is great yeah so it can actually affect negatively a lot of people. So I don't know. That. On the OSINT side, I'm, I'm I'm always a little bit skeptical and I always refrain a little bit because it can destroy people's life. Yeah, I mean, this is kind of where I go with when we look at like people's well-being and stuff. Like, if we find something, you know, if you find a vulnerability and you take precautions within your own risk appetite because all life is, you know, every action you do from a personal point of view uh, carries risk and reward. And um, I mean, the thing I would say is sometimes people seem to get very stressed out about some things they can't control. Um, I would focus on what you can control and, you know, work in a way that, that is, is suitable and keeps you, keeps, you, keeps you out of uh, handcuffs, right? <laughs> if I can, if I can give a a, a, not a positive spin on the OSINT inside, I would say it depends on the risk appetite and on the cultural aspect of the organization to actually not blame a person, but blame a process for it. It's like if you find a vulnerability by leveraging a human being, you actually need to think twice about the process that are surrounding that person, not blame the person and have an escape code. Also because 90% of the time, the process will remain there and the person who's going to be replaced will make the same mistake because yeah, the process yeah, is sure. person. And yeah, I agree. Look, I mean, again, like this human centric element is really key uh, in my messaging for, for everything I do really. Um, we have to work together with people to improve society, to improve businesses, to improve you know, uh, improve security, and that's a human element. We do it through technology, but in the end, this is this is human stuff. So, you know, if you find stuff, be responsible with it. Um, so, if I can ask you to leave us with a couple of positive message, one on the overall security aspect of it, are we improving or are we decreasing the security aspect of it? Do, do you know what I, I think? Uh, even though it's from, uh, we've had sort of like global incidents, as it were. So security is improving it's never going to improve at the rate that i think that some people will want it to um there's never just you know the business outcome of just security generally speaking right um i think we're moving on the right track i mean you look at the stuff microsoft are doing you look at the capabilities you know you can deploy highly secure systems i, I put up a ctf online and i spent five minutes uh, locking it down i didn't even play test and no one managed to shell the box actually right. on on that on that subject i deployed a couple of raspberry pi in one of the defcon and nobody actually bothered <laughs> yeah totally. and i was I mean, surprised <laughs> <laughs> uh, not everything gets pwned I, I was in a system the other day and i had remote access and the passwords were weak it didn't have mfa it didn't have a WAF. 
Uh, and I looked and I was like, ah, even if it has been pwned, I checked out the functionality and the actual site was broken. So even though you could enumerate all the machines on the, on the network, um, you there couldn't actually do anything going. with it. <laughs> and well, that's like, the best security, right? You yeah, yeah, the yeah. Machine, you put <laughs> turn in off the machine. You. <laughs> um, granted, through that, you could. I mean, this is particular scenario. Uh, the vector was either stolen creds, brute forced. Even if you got that, you could go into OA. It's the usual stuff, um, yeah. and that's what we need to work on, right? People focus on blinky boxes and edge cases and crazy ass APT scenarios. Um, when the, you like simple stuff turn off responder from working put windows firewall on make sure your service accounts have good uh you know long strong uh passwords use password managers um you know get the basics right patch stuff patching is difficult don't get me wrong i mean no. it's not not easy to turn around and just force something out but but if you commit you actually you actually can make a difference Regular yeah. patching is way simpler than doing, you know, once a year massive. How about uh, regular rebuild? It's way yeah. easier. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, the trouble is when you work at large scale, high maturity organizations, and then you go into the masses of the business or, you know, of, of the networks world, there is a big divide. Not everyone has the capability to. I bet to disagree. I bet to disagree. I've seen, I was talking with, with the guys from Netflix, Netflix. They did that at scale, but just because they were in engineering led, they actually put that as a core element. Now, they don't have a lot of legacy because it just came out, but they, they rooted that thinking in the core of the engineering practice. I think we can still do it. It's, it's, it's I, I'm, not, I'm, not I'm not disagreeing with that. But when you go into existing uh, brownfield environments where their focus is not software, and there's a lot of businesses, at least in the UK, uh, where they are not en engineering houses. They are uh, you know, supply chain, logistics, manufacturing. They, there's quite a lot of businesses that have, that have a lot of legacy. They've got a lot of spaghetti. Um, hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's a smaller scale. And it's, it's, it's it, it becomes much harder at, at, at that sort of level. But again, it, look, it's basics, right? Uh, if you can stop someone from getting malware on your device, or even if you sit there and go, let's assume that your AV will fail, because it, it probably will, um, what happens if someone has an agent on an endpoint? You know, treat the use an assume breach model, do stuff from a, a white box point of view do the basics you're going to make uh you're going to make someone's life a hell of a lot harder just by doing some relatively simple things all right daniel i unfortunately had to close but i can talk about this forever yeah. actually janice <laughs> was proposing was was actually throwing an interesting proposal for the folks in um for the folks here from london we were proposing to have uh, a beer or a night out maybe we can catch all together um Actually, on, on the subject of getting all together, on day 18, we have the Cloud Security Alliance annual meeting where we do some talks around the cloud and some talks around this. Uh, Danny, if you want to speak or come along, you're more than welcome. Yeah, 18th sure. of June at 1 p.m., uh, Canary Wharf, HSBC building, 8 Canary. That's, uh, I'm just checking, that's Tuesday, right? I... Yeah, it's somewhere along along there. <laughs> cool. Yeah, just if you. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I've just checked my diary. That's free, so um, I'd love to. I'll ping you across some uh, some details. Cool. Hey guys, All right. Uh, sorry, a quick one. How long, how long is um, the the Cloud Alliance um, event? How long is it? One p.m. or when? It's one p.m. to six p.m. with drinks, free drinks. Perfect. Okay. Okay. So, Any yeah, other? Yeah, yeah, I mean, we, we're going to have some discussion afterwards. That's why that's why I put drinks for people that can't make to the conference. But please attend the conference because it's really cool. All right. Any other questions? Yeah, sorry. Francisco, is it 1 p.m. sharp? Because most likely some of us may, may be coming from, from office, from work, taking a half day and that. Yeah, we have we have some some uh, admin stuff and some welcoming stuff, so it probably will be one 
dirty when we kick off. But the, the detail agenda is on the side. So I shared the site. Um, the, the tickets are on even bright. And I'll share the detail on, on the community. Uh, Danny, I also invite you to the community so you can... Actually, on, on the subject of the community, why don't we merge the two communities so that people can, can ask and share? We have a Slack community. So we, cr we could cross invite people on the two community or merge the two community together. I think Danny left. Daniel? Yeah, yeah, I'm here, I'm here. <laughs> Sorry, was that to me? Sorry, I didn't realize that was to me. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> and, we can merge the communities. Yeah, and anything that we do to... Um, I guess of all these things, it's all about how we can share and uh, help each other develop and grow. Um, yeah. You know, and share knowledge because most people are facing the same challenges. So, like you said before, there's no point in having a, a 400 patterns uh, <laughs> no. to solve the same problem. It's much better if we get together and, and, and share intelligence and share uh, our thinkings. So, all right. Thank you very much, everybody. Cool. Thank you, Daniel. Thank really you very much for having this. me. Really Cheers, fun. Dan. Cheers. I'll, I'll, share, I'll share the I share the recording on on the Slack and I share the recording with you, Daniel. And maybe we can add some beep here and there. <laughs> yeah, cool. No problem. I'll have to mute it. I can't stand hearing my own voice, right? So <laughs> sorry to everyone for listening. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Massively. Thank you, Daniel. Thanks, Thanks, guys. Cheers. Cheers. Bye bye. Cheers. Bye. bye.